Okay, today is the conclusion of our series. I highly encourage you, if you have not heard it, um, because it's been building and building on different parts of it, I encourage you to go to cornerstonecheshire.com, and there you'll see the series. And we're again, we're working on uh, getting our podcast up and uh, Spotify and uh, iTunes and all that, so you can actually download it and don't take up data when you're driving. So all that kind of fun. So we're working on that. Hopefully, by the end of the month, we'll be good with that. But I encourage you to catch up on the series you have not heard already. We dealt with, for example, how can you trust the Bible? Did a man write it? How do you know it's the Word of God? Uh, and, and I will tell you that we've gone through this, and we've come to the conclusion that it takes more faith to believe it's not the Word of God than it is the Word of God. Well, today, we're talking about this, remaining, <clears throat> excuse me, remaining and growing in the Word. Remaining and growing in the Word. It's one thing to hear something, but how do you grow in it? How do you move forward in it? And so today we're going to be talking about that. And so before we do that, let me go ahead and give you a little bit of a background. It's this. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. This is Jesus Christ, okay? All things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things and in Him all things hold together. This has been our theme verses throughout our series. And basically what we're saying is the Spirit of Christ holds the universe together. And I will say this. The Spirit of Christ will hold your life together and my life together. You pull Jesus out of your life, things fall apart. You pull Jesus out of our culture, it falls apart. We're salt and we're light. You pull Jesus out of, of creation, it all comes apart. Even science has been telling us that there's something holds it all together. There is a force. It is the Spirit of Jesus Christ. That's what that is. And which is, uh, to me, it blows me away that the Bible talks about this before science even realized there's a constant. And so what we've been talking about is building our life upon Christ. He holds it all together. Now, how do we keep the Word in us? And how does it transform us? Let me just tell you something else. I, as an example, how many of you uh, like it when someone's driving, when you have a, several people in your car, maybe your mother-in-law is in the back seat, and uh, they're, everyone's telling you how to drive the car, where to go, where to make a right, you're going too fast, slow it out. How many love that? I just enjoy it so much. Am I the only one that likes it? Okay. Uh, but so many times the word, the world will tell us what to do, right? Make a left here, make a right here. If you're like me, unfortunately, I become so dependent upon uh, my GPS. In fact, I don't listen to my GPS. I listen to Waze. And I'm convinced that Jesus was here today. He says, I am the Waze. I am the truth. And I am the life. And, and so I'll pay attention to that. But I remember the days before Waze. I remember the days before cell phones were a luxury. It used to be a luxury for the very, very highly lifestyles that rich and famous had phones. They had these big bricks. I remember the days when there was no, no cell phones. It kind of was. And you actually had to put a dime into a little payphone. Anyhow, I remember one time driving, I was going to see White Hart at uh, King's College with some friends of mine uh, in New York, and I was driving, we went through the Bronx, and I got lost. If you've ever driven with me, you know that happens, okay? And, and what happened was um, my tank was running low, and I had three or four people telling me what to do, make it right here, and, and everyone that told me what to do was wrong. I didn't have a map with me. And so I was running out of gas. We are in a really bad section. It's so bad if you go to White Castle, there's plexiglass between the people that are serving you and the, and the dining room. That's how bad it was. Okay, it was bad. And, and so I'm freaking out. Thank God, somehow or another, we got out. I kept asking for directions. I finally broke down and asked for directions. For those of you who do not understand that, that's what men used to do. Uh, now what we do is we, we get upset at the GPS. So anyhow, you got to listen to the ways, Right? The GPS. And so what the Bible is, the Bible is a map for your life. It tells you how to navigate through this life, what to do, how to do it, okay? Now, having the maps is good, but I like when Waze talks to me, and I'll, I'll put the full GPS on there, not just the alerts for the police when we pray for the police. And the police are out there. We love the police. 
But what happens is it actually talks to you. And you know what that's like? That's like the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's like the counselor. The Holy Spirit's the one, not your mother-in-law. Praise Jesus, okay? That will talk to you. I love my mother-in-law, by the way. I'm just speaking to everyone else. And my mother-in-law is here today. Is she here today? I love my mother-in-law. She's awesome. Okay, let me make that clear. But rather than have somebody else tell you what to do, you listen to the GPS, the ways, and you listen to the navigation voice. All right? And that's like the Holy Spirit. The beautiful thing is God has given us his word, but he also gave us something else, a tutor called the Holy Spirit. Now, I've, at times, I've done this. We were driving in New Jersey, going to see my brother in Philadelphia area, and all of a sudden, the ways said, get off here. I'm like, why on earth would I get off? We're going fast. Everyone, no, I'm not getting off here. That's wrong. Two hours later, we were in traffic. I didn't listen. And so many times, God tells us what to do. But we see it, what we think we understand. We listen to the people in the car, and we get lost. And so what the Word of God is, basic instructions before leaving earth, B-I-B-L-E, but it's also a living testament. There's something else I wanted to bring to your attention as we sum and tie all this up. The Bible is dangerous without a relationship with Jesus Christ. This is why we saw the wars, the crusades, and all the horrible things that happened in history, quote unquote, from the church. It was people who did not have a relationship with Christ, and if they did, they threw him out, and they used the word to hurt people. The Bible without a relationship with Jesus is dangerous. You need a relationship with Jesus to understand the Bible, okay? So let's go ahead, and, and we're going to kind of wrap up this whole thing today. And this is what the Word of God says. This is Jesus speaking here, okay? He says the following. If, if you continue in my word, then you're truly my disciples of mine, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free, make you free. Now, I, I, just, I want to stop here for a moment. Uh, it was not originally planned to talk about this, but I just feel like I need to bring this up. How many of you are tired of being told what you're not doing right? Okay, I'm the only one. Okay, there's several of you. How many ever come to church, and here we, uh, let's go to church and hear how I'm blowing it again. Fantastic. I need to love this, I need to do this, can't do this, can't do that. You come to church, and you're hearing what else you're not doing right. If you're like me, all week long, your conscience is telling you, you did this wrong, or maybe someone else is telling you. I'm not going to say who that is. But you're hearing what you're doing wrong all the time, and it's like, i got to do this, this, and the other. And you, after a while, you're like, no, forget it. I, I can't do this thing anymore. And if you're at that place today, praise the Lord Jesus Christ, you're in a good place. Because you can't do it. And if we read the word of God, if you, then you will. Let's stop that for a moment. Because God is not asking us to live for him. One of the hallmarks of this church, you're going to hear all the time. We don't want you living for Jesus. Please do not live for God. Do not live for God. It's a mistake. It's a trap. Live with God. Live with God. Because if you live with God, you're not doing it by yourself. You can live for God and not have God in your life. But you can't live with God unless he's in your life. My friends, that's the vast difference. And so when it says, if you continue my word, he's saying, if you continue my word, listen to me. I'm right alongside you. My burden is light. My yoke is easy is easy. Can you guys do me a big favor? Can you put the clock in the back wall? Because I'll, I'll preach till like next year. If I don't have a clock behind there, I'm going to just go on and on. All right, thank you. Um, if you can, how many want to hear me preach? Okay. <laughs> if you continue in my sermon, okay. If you continue my word, then you're truly my disciples of mine, and you will gnosko. No, that, that Greek word is gnosko, and, and gnosko is intimately no. And when they translate the Old Testament, which is written in Hebrew, and they use the Greek, it's called a Septuagint, and when it says Adam knew E, they use the word, if I'm not mistaken, it is gnosko, which is intimacy. Intimacy that brings life. And so what God is asking us to do is not just to hear the word, but let the word become part of us. The two became one flesh. And what God wants us to do for our own good, is let his word become our flesh. That's what he wants us to do. You see, I love what Charles Spurgeon says. A Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. 
someone who's in, getting into the word of the Lord. And today, what we're going to do is wrap this up. I want to give you some practical tools, but we're also going to talk about how to make it happen, okay? Now, how do we change? Number one, we have to build into the foundation of my life. You can't always see what's on top of a building. You don't see the foundation, but the foundation is so important. We have to build our lives on the foundation of Jesus. I've known people that have cracked foundations in their homes, and what they had to do is a big deal. You had to jack the house up. Sometimes you got to jack yourself up on Christ, okay? <laughs> okay, well, let me make that clear, okay? Take that out of context and put it on the internet. I'm in trouble, okay? But sometimes you have to jack yourself off the foundation and change your foundation. And, 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 and build it on Jesus Christ. Build it on the Bible, his word. Build it into the foundation of my life. Everyone, this is everyone, everyone who hears these words of mine, hears these words and puts them into practice, is like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. We even had a tower up here, remember that? We started pulling things out, started, and it, it collapsed. And I will tell you that our culture today, you can see what's happening. Our culture, I hate to say it, I wish it could be more positive, but in many ways, our culture is falling apart. It's toppling over. When you see teenagers at 16 years old going into a high school and shooting people up, what on earth is going on? We are worried, more worried about domestic people inside our country and terrorism than we are from Al-Qaeda. Why? Because there's no fear of God. Without God, we act godless. And what happens? You pull Jesus out, things fall apart. And you see that happen. What do we do in this type of situation? We have to build our lives upon the foundation of Christ, especially in now, when times are going well. Okay, so what are some things that people build their lives on and, and let them control by this? One thing is a popular culture, right? Popular culture, what, what's going on, keeping up with you-know-whos, okay? The popular culture. And, and we want to do what popular culture says. And I have a news for you. Popular culture is usually wrong. Following the popular crowd. I, I remember being at the airport, Bradley International, and I'm running, and there's a huge line to go to the security checkpoint. I'm like, wait a minute, there's another line down there. So I left that crowded line and went down to the other. There's barely anyone there. Because if you follow the crowd, you're going to be wrong half the time. The Bible says... Broad is the road that leads to hell, but narrow is the one that leads to life. So you cannot listen to popular culture. Let me say something else about popular culture. Do not underestimate the power of culture that it has upon you. I'm not affected by culture. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. How do you know that? Because you're in culture. God has designed us and made us where our environment controls us to a certain extent. If you're not aware of the influence culture has on you, it will influence you even more. Let me tell you an example. It's like secondhand smoke. I don't smoke cigarettes, but if I hang out in a place like, a, like the, remember the old days of bowling alleys? Oh, it was unbelievable. Okay, now they don't have that anymore, thank God. But anyhow, but I, going in there in a bowling alley, I come home, my mother's like, I'm a teenager, are you smoking with your friends? No, I'm bowling. Sure. <laughs> but my whole leather jacket smelled like smoke. Why? Secondhand smoke gets on me. I had to clean my clothes. My friends, just being in the world, we need to wash ourselves in the water of the word to get off the stink of the earth, the stink of our culture, because it's there. Popular culture, if it's popular, it's probably wrong. All right? Do not follow the crowd in doing wrong very clearly. Another thing people do is reason. And this is the problem. You make your logical conclusions based on the information you have. Do we have all the information of the universe? No. So for me to say, I know more than the person that created the universe, God, is arrogant. And what that basically does is I've turned my own reason into what? Into my God. And, and he would say, well, I'm scientific. The scientific method is how I make my decision. If I can measure it, if I can weigh it, then it must be true. If I cannot see it, touch it, or feel it, it must not be true. And so we make our, our decisions based upon faulty reason with incomplete information. It doesn't work. Pop a culture. And perhaps my, it says here, there is a way that appears right, but in the end, it leads to death. You see what's going on today in our culture, everybody? 
It's really sad. What's going on today? I mean, what, some things that are so obvious, they're redefining everything. And you redefine it and mess people up and abuse people. It's terrible. There's a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. We can see it happening in our culture, everybody. We've been telling people all their lives, it's not what's on the outside, what's on the inside. Now we're telling people, change your outside to change your inside. It never works that way. You always got to change from the inside out. We tell people, don't worry how you look, and now we're saying it matters how you look. It's like, what? I mean, poor children, they're like, what do I believe? Doesn't matter who you're on the outside, it matters what you're on the inside. Then it matters what you're on the outside. I'm like, what on earth? There's such confusion. There's a way that appears right. And perhaps my favorite influence upon us is this. Feelings. Thank you. I'm going to tell John we have a great choir here for Christmas. And as a matter of fact, get ready for Christmas and get ready to invite folks. We're going to have five Christmas services, candlelight. And so we could use a choir like you. All right, here we go. You're going to be the choir out there. But we have public culture, reason, and feelings. You cannot trust your feelings, everybody. You cannot trust your... I, can I just tell you something? Don't trust your feelings. I know it makes nice movies. Search your feelings. Trust your feelings. No, I don't trust my feelings. My feelings are so inaccurate at times. But maybe my mind or I, I sense things. Well, hang on. Hang on. At the time, there was no king in Israel. People did whatever they felt like doing. That was the book of Judges, the tragic book of Judges. They did what they felt like they were supposed to do. Let me say something about feelings as well. Feelings are absolutely wonderful servants but make lousy masters. Feelings are important. Don't discount feelings. That's important. But you cannot base your life upon feelings. Because feelings are up and down. They're subjective, completely subjective. Okay, And your feelings will lie to you and you don't even know why. You could have a scenario in your life that at four years old, something happened that scared you, and now you're 45 years old, and something happens, and it triggers something in you, brings up fear, and you're like, why am I afraid of this little spider? Because mom screamed at the top of her lungs when you threw a spider, in her, threw, threw a spider at her when she was in the shower. Now you have arachophobia. Okay? So now I'm afraid of spiders. Why? Based on my, so you can't trust your feelings. Okay? Cognitive therapy, they talk about it, where you, you change... For what's a lie and turn it to truth. And, and often feelings are based upon that cognitive therapy. You think a certain way. Those emotions are released into your system, get released into your brain. Now, automatically, your subconscious pours out these emotions. Well, how do you change that? Bathe yourself in the Word of God. Feelings are wonderful, sir, but terrible masters. Now, the, word, the world's way of relationships. You want to have a relationship. This is how the world tells you to have a relationship. Okay? Here we go. You need to find the right person. I'm so incomplete. I'm going to sing. Can I sing again? No, I'm not going to sing. I'm going to sing an air supply song and date myself. <laughs> I'm all out of love. I'm so lost without you. I'm dating myself. I'm all out of love. I'm so lost without him. Okay? So find the right person person. That's the first thing. Number two, fall in love. I just fell in love. I fell in love. Okay? I can't help myself. I fell in love. And here, and the third one is this. Fix all your hopes and dreams in that person. I can't live without your love. I'm not in Chicago. I'm sorry. I'm really dating myself. I, I, I don't know anything since 1992. I apologize. I checked out of the musical culture since then. At least I got rid of my mullet. Okay? So give me a little credit where credit's due. But fix all your hopes and dreams on that part. You make me whole. Hallelujah. I need you. Listen, I love Sandra. She's amazing. She really is. And it, she's not perfect. And so if I fix all my hopes and dreams on her, she's my reason for living. Well, I'm sorry, but she's an imperfect being. Guess what I turn her to be? God. Now, even worse, if she tries to find all hope and, and healing in me, she's in really a big trouble. So you, you put expectations on somebody. No one can produce that. No one can make you happy. So that's not a waste to build your life. 
And this is what we do. We find the right person, fall in love, fix all your hopes and dreams in that person. Gary Chapman in his wonderful book, Five Love Languages, says the following. He says that in love feeling lasts about 18 to 24 months. That's when you're like, the endorphins are pulping into your body, you can't even think. Here we go. If failure occurs, repeat steps one through three. Falling in and out of love, in and out of love, right? Uh, you know, it's just like well, over and over. You want to live your life that way? No. no. Looking for that feelings. Nothing. Okay, sorry. All right. Now, what does the Bible say to do? I mean, it tells you. Be the right person first by giving your life to the right God, right? Walk in love. Love does not think of its own way, right? Love, you know, and the next one would be this. Fix your hope on God and honor him through your relationships. So now it's about God. Now, Sandra is God's daughter. I better not mess around with my father-in-law's little girl, right? There's a relationship there, okay? So you have fix your hope on God and honor him through your relationships, not by your own thoughts and feelings. So it's all about what? God. God's my source. God is my source. There's only one person in the entire universe that is perfect, and that's Almighty God. All right? Doesn't work. If failure occurs, repeat steps one, two, three. How much better is that, everybody? It works. Isn't it nice to know you're off the hook? And for those of you that are, are trying to find the right person and Maybe you're, you know, I don't know how old you are, if you're 50s or 40s or 30s or 20s, you're like, I got to get married, I got to get married. And, and you're going out with people that are on, uh, they're, they're on the weekend furlough. I said, no, 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 from prison. No, no, no. Just, okay, just. He smiled at me. Yeah, I know he smiled at you. You're the first woman he's seen in two years. <laughs> Become the right person, everybody. Walk in love. Fix your hope and dreams. Jesus, thank you. You're my source and strength. Now, can I hear an amen from people? What happens? Uh, how, okay. Everyone that's married here. Never mind. I'm not going to start. I'll give you. <laughs> Is your spouse perfect, everybody? <laughs> Smart man. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Ph.D. Okay, what do you do when I don't understand the Bible? I don't understand what it's talking about. I can't understand it. What do you do? Well, I'm not going to, I don't, well, this is what you need to do. When you don't understand it, you do what it says anyhow. Because I'm going to believe what God says, even if I don't understand it. Because I'm not God. I'm not God. I can't even explain to you the cell signals going through the air right now. Can you? I can't even explain how this TV works. What do I do when I don't like it? Well, I don't want to be left alone, and I'm afraid that he or she is not going to be with me, so I'm going to live with them, lest they do not go. Or how about this one? He's, he's forcing me, and I would go out, and he wants to, you know, he wants to uh, kiss me and do things with me. I just feel kind of uncomfortable. I want to lose him. If, let me tell you right now, if any man does that, you send him, I'll get a posse of gentlemen, and we'll take care of him for you, okay? <laughs> but what do I do when I don't like it? I don't like it. I don't care if you don't like it. Trust the word of God. Don't be arrogant and think you know it all. Okay, now how do, we, how do we get the scriptures in us? You need to approach it with the right attitude. Your heart is your attitude in many ways, right? And so what we want to do is allow God's word to come in our lives. So what we're going to do in the remaining time here today, we're going to talk about how the word of God gets in us. I'm going to give you some practical, pragmatic tools to help you get the word in you. And then we're going to finish our time giving you an illustration of how you can get it in you. Okay? Here we go. Approach it with the right attitude. Okay? This is what Jesus gives a parable. It says the following. A sower. What's a sower? A sower would do this in the time of Christ. They'd have these little pathways, and he'd walk on, or he or she, or mommy, would walk on the pathway and trample the ground, and they'd throw the seed in the bag. And pretty much, whatever he's walking on would be hard ground. But this other part, you try to make the soil nice so the seed would take to it. So that's what they would do. So they understood what Jesus was talking about. Okay, because they're in an agriculture society. So a sower went out to sow his seed. As he sowed, some of it fell along the path and was trampled underfoot. And the birds of the air devoured it. 
And some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture, and some fell among the thorns. And the thorns grew up, and it choked it, and some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. As he said these things, he called out, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And so you're looking at this, what is this all about? Jesus would do this a lot. Jesus will call out to you and give you a little bit of a mystery. And he wants you to draw close to him so you can find out what it is. Isn't that manipulation? No. He, doesn't, he wants to hold you accountable. But he doesn't want to give you more accountability than you're able to handle. Because he knows you have to judge you based upon what you know. So he'll give you a little information. If you're really interested, you're going to go further. And he'll show you more and more. That's how God works, progression, everybody. Okay? So anyhow, we'll talk about that at the end today. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when his disciples asked him, what does this parable mean? He said to them, to you it's been given to know the secrets of the kingdom. How do you know the secrets of the kingdom? Listen to God in relationship. And he'll start telling you things and showing you things. Okay? That's how you do it. All right? Those along the footpath are the ones who hear. And then the devil comes along and takes away the word from their hearts. There are people that will walk out of here today. By the time you get to your parking lot, you'll have the crow coming down, taking the word out of your head. You'll forget what I said. If you forget what I say, you're in deep trouble. No. But seriously, you'll hear the word of God and you'll forget it. it the seed comes down, but it's so hard. Your heart is so hard, it does not penetrate. Okay? And she takes away the word from their hearts. And as they cannot believe, so they cannot believe and be saved. And there are people like that. And so, listen, everybody, you just throw the seed. Throw the seed. God will work on their hearts, and they have to work on their own hearts. All right? So that's the first type of creeple. For, for, but for the others, they're in parables so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand, lest they turn, Jesus says. And go back to verse 9. Now, the parables is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so they may not believe and be saved. And the ones on the rock are those who hear. Those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But, those ha but these have no root. They believe for a while, and in time of testing, they fall away. And as for the, what fell among the thorns, they're the ones who hear it. But as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of this life. You ever see that? You're choked by what? Cares. I'm so worried. I'm so worried. I can't trust God. I can't trust God. I'm going to hold on to my life. I can't trust God at anything. Let go. No, I will not let go. I got to trust God. I got to trust God. God's like, I want to get you free. No, I can't get you free. It's like a monkey holding on to a bunch of bananas and his hands in a jar. He can't get it out. You got to let go of the bananas. Get it out. Let go of your bananas. Take that home. As for what, okay, we hear that. They're choked by the cares and the riches and pleasures of life and their fruit does not mature. As for the good soil, there are those who hearing the word hold fast to it. They seed. And by the way, isn't it great? It talks about seed. Think about seeds. Are seeds like, what's a seed? It's, it's so fragile, right? And the beautiful thing about seeds is the seeds do its own work. All you have to do with seeds is put it in the right environment, and the seeds will do what seeds do. It will grow. And so our objective, everybody, is not to make ourselves change. Our objective is to let God's word get in our hearts and let it begin to grow. Our job is to make the soil right. And obey what the seed says and watch what God will do. Okay? So as for that, the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold fast to it in an, an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. It takes patience. Okay? So what's the hardened soil? That's a closed mind. There are people, mm -mm, I made my mind up. Mm -mm, I'm not going to forgive that person. I know the Bible says that, but I'm mm, not going to do it. Okay, if you have a closed mind, you can't receive. You're hardened. And the seed will bounce off of you, and the bird will come quickly, and you will not even have it. We're going to break it down further about that later on, okay? So you have the hardened soil, a closed mind. Listen, uh, you need to have an open mind with the Scripture. What does that mean? That means don't go to the Scripture like you know it already. Go to the Scripture, Holy Spirit, open my mind. Let me receive what you have for me today. And you know what happens in hardened soil? 
if you're familiar with potters, uh, people that uh, are sculptors, what they will do, they have a spinning wheel. And they'll put water on that clay to keep it soft, and they can shape it. But if you're not throwing water on that clay, what happens? It gets hardened, and you cannot shape it anymore. You have to throw it away. You see, what we need to be doing is this. Let our world spin it around. It's going crazy, isn't it? But let the water of the word come on your heart every day. The Bible says in Ephesians, husbands, wash your wives in the water of the word. So getting in the Word every day, just a little bit every day, five minutes, ten minutes, just wash it. Let the I don't get anything out of it. Keep on doing it. It keeps you soft. Just this morning, I was reading in Proverbs, and it was saying that the biggest test comes when you have success. So watch out for success. And I was reading another passage of Scripture in Hebrews chapter 13, an amazing scripture, and it just, what did it do? It opened me up to receive more from God because I start hearing from the Holy Spirit. It keeps me soft, that God can mold me through the day. Okay, so the hardened soil, a closed mind. Action, I must cultivate an open mind. Saying, God, I don't have this thing figured out, but you do. The rocky soil represents those who hear the message with joy. But like young plants in such soil, their roots don't go very deep. These are the people that are emotional. Okay, praise God, you know, they give their life to Christ. They show up at church, they're at every single event. They even quote scripture on their Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat. I mean, they're all about Jesus, and they're criticizing you for not being in church enough. Six months later, where they are, I have no idea. And they fall away. It's based upon emotions. Are they sincere? Yes. But the problem is, it's all about emotions. And the problem is this. As long as God gives me an emotional kick, I'm going to serve him. But the moment I don't get a kick from God, I'm going to kick God out. And you know what? There comes times where you just have to hold on to the truth whether you feel it or not. And God might take you through a season where you have to, your roots have to go deep. You cannot live your life on what you feel for the moment and emotions. And so we've been bad too as a church. We've been saying this. Give your life to Jesus and get a better marriage. Give your life to Jesus and find a marriage. Give your life to Jesus. Get rid of your spouse. Give your life to Jesus and have riches. In, no. Give your life to Jesus and die. That doesn't, that doesn't really, I don't like, it doesn't build, how am I supposed to build a church by telling people to give my life to Jesus and die? Jesus says, unless you pick up your cross and follow me daily, you can have no part of me. God's asking everything. Why? Because he loves us and he knows what's best for us. And we can't experience the true prosperity unless we're willing to let go of our control. And if people make emotional decisions about God, and we sell Jesus sometimes, we don't tell them the other side of the gospel. The reason why the gospel is good news is because there's bad news. And there's a place called hell and destruction. If you want to know what it's like, see what happened in California at that high school. That's a little example of what hell's like. But God loves us so much that he sent Jesus to suffer, that we could be free from this crazy corrupt world so the roots don't go very deep emotions only they believe for a while but when they wilt when the hot winds of testing blow I didn't get her back I didn't get the job I didn't get that and that's what can happen we have the shallow soil. That, that, that's a superficial mind. It's all superficial. It's all like, I'm a cultural Christian. I go to church. I like it. It's good for my family. I, you know, I, I, I think there's good things about the Bible and all that. But you know what? <laughs> let's be real. We're in the 21st century. Come on. Let's be real. Come on. We can't do these things. And they have a superficial mind. And what happens? What's the action? I must make time for God's word. I have to get rid of that superficial mind. You have to let it go deeper, everybody. The Bible says, by now you should be teachers. Why are you still on the milk of the word? You should be growing in God. If you're not growing forward, you're going backwards. And so what we want to do is make time for God's word. The seed that fell among the weeds uh, stands for those who hear as they go on their way, not his way. They are choked. You ever feel like you're choked by life? It's like, I have so much debt that I don't know what to do. I, 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 I buy things I can't afford, and I have to tell lies to, to cover the other lies. I, I forgot which lies I said. And everything, you're up, you're like swimming, and you barely can swim through life. 
You're choked by life's worries. I'm worried about this. I'm worried about that. Or the riches. I got to get rich. I got to get rich. Got to get rich. I have to get more money. I get more money. I have more control. More money. Or pleasures. I just want to have a good time. I don't care about money. I just want to have a good time. And all these things, you get choked by worries, the worrying. It sounds like it's more noble, the worry. Riches or pleasures, and they don't mature. They don't mature in God. The soil with weeds equals a preoccupied mind. Can you say squirrel? You're so busy collecting all the nuts. <laughs> okay. So you're preoccupied. You can't even listen to God. You can't even sit still for a moment. What would God want us to do? Action. I must eliminate the distractions. You have to take time. to. If you're so busy, you have no time for God. You're too busy. I think we're doing, we, seriously, most of us can cut out half of what we do and be fine. We're too busy. If you're running the soccer, violin, taekwondo, archery, basket, and you're constantly running here, running there, and you're going back and forth, and you're running your kids here, running your kids there, you're trying to go all these things, you're coming to church every night for every event, but you have no time to read your Bible. It's preoccupied. Eliminate the distractions. Be still and know that I am God. If you can't be still, you can't know he's God. I'm not talking about being lazy, but we get too occupied. Always have to have a ready. I have to have K-Love on. I, I, listen, I love K-Love, but sometimes turn K-Love off. Put the chicken sandwich down. <laughs> I'm not going to mention which chicken sandwich it is. And just listen to God. Listen to God, right? Eliminate the distractions. The seeds fell on good soil. Stand for those who hear the message and retain it. Why? Because they prepared their hearts. Whatever you say, God, I am not going to tell you what to do. I'm going to listen to your word. In a good and obedient heart, and they persist until they bear fruit. I love that. They persist until they bear fruit. In Hebrews chapter 11, they saw their promise afar off. Many people that we celebrate to, like Abraham, did not see the fulfillment of God's promises on this side of heaven. This is not the end. Heaven is our end with God. And it's not an end. It's an end to a beginning. We've got to keep our minds off of this earth. We have to shoot beyond this earth to really live right in this earth for God until we bear fruit. The good soil equals a willing mind. Are you willing? That's all you have to be is willing. You don't have to have it all together, but if you're willing, that's what it really matters. And how do you do that? Do what it says. I know the Bible says this. I must forgive this person. I know the Bible said I should not be um, having sex with my girlfriend before I'm getting married, and so I'm not going to have sex with my girl. I don't have a girlfriend, okay? Let me make that clear. Okay, but you know what I'm saying. I'm not gonna, even though the Bible says I should pay under Caesar, what's, I should give my taxes to God and report my income, even though I can't afford it, I'm going to do it anyhow. You've got to obey God. Do what it says. Trust the word of God. It works, everybody. Okay, it works, everybody. So how do we do this? How do we do this? Sow for yourself righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. Listen, all the time, we got to be cultivating our heart. Every day, break up that heart. How do you break it up? You break it up by breaking whatever's not of God. That's what you break. The, otherwise, your heart, your, your heart gets hard. For it's time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Okay, how do we make it a, a part of our diet? How Make it a daily part of my diet. How do I do that? We're going to break down some practical things in the next few minutes, okay? The Bible says in Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you. See, let God's word dwell in you. His word will do its work. If you listen to it, his word will work, okay? We're going to break it down a little bit later. How do how to let the Bible dwell in you. How do you do it? First of all, I'm going to get practical here. I'm going to say it again. I mentioned it before, but I'm going to mention it again because so many people come up to me and say, I don't understand what it says. Get a translation that you can understand. That's not the Book of Mormon, okay? Okay, what is that? 
Okay, let me explain different types of Bibles. You have the formal equivalency. What does that mean? It means it takes the Greek and Hebrew, and what it does is it translates it, word, tries to do word for word. Okay, so that's what it tries to do. And sometimes it's not as smooth. And that would be the King James Version. New King James Version, New American Standard Version, which is really wooden in that way, and the English Standard Version. They're, they're called formal equivalency. They try to translate word by word. They do the best they can. Then you have something called functional equivalency. What does that mean? That means they translate the idea of the sentence. If, you're, if you've ever been in another country and if someone translates for you, what they do, they hear what you say, and then they say it in a way that what you're meant to say. And that's, for example, that's the NL, NLT, which I happen to like for reading. It's nice. If I want to study, I'm going back to here. I'll go into original language. NLT, good news. Today's English version or NIV. Those are functional equivalency. The NIV kind of, kind of a mixture of the two. Okay, then you have this paraphrase, which don't, I mean, it's okay to read it as an extra filler, but don't base your theology on that, please. Okay, and that would be the Living Bible, okay, which is good for kids, the message, things of that nature. Let me go ahead and and show you how each one's a little bit different. And this is now the King James Version. Okay? I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Okay? Charity suffered long. It is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth itself, not itself. It's not puffed up. Now, what is it? Is it in British? No, I'm just having a little fun. Okay? There's nothing wrong with that. It's, it sounds really nice. Right? But look what it has to say in the NIV. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envy, love is, does not boast, it's not proud. Now, how much clearer is that? And King James Version was written in the 1600s, everybody. The Apostle Paul did not speak King James. I'm sorry, King James, wherever you are. All right. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 in the message says this. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut. It doesn't have a swelled head, <laughs> okay? And that's kind of fun, right? That's kind of fun, but it kind of breaks it down a little bit. But don't base your theology on that. Is that clear, everybody? Are you tracking with me, everybody? I'm trying to make it practical here, okay? And we're going to get, okay? And I also want to encourage you, get a study Bible. If you don't have one, get one. And, uh, yeah, you can go online and get that. But something about having a paper Bible, you don't have to worry about electricity. And you don't have to worry about getting text messages and Instagrams and checking what your friend had for dinner last night or the alpha they had. Okay, get a study Bible. Here's some good ones, all right? You want to do some screenshots? Do it on your own. You know, if you're going to be a part of a team, you have to practice the fundamentals. If you're a basketball player, practice doing the shots, practicing dribbling. Eat right, go to the gym, right? But then you also need to go with the team. But here's some good Bibles I want to encourage you with. Uh, one is called the uh, Jesus Bible. And the whole study Bible, it shows Jesus through the whole Bible, which is amazing. That's a great study. That's a nice Bible. The one I like and I have right here is called the uh, New King James Version Spirit-Filled Bible. And the editor was one of the men I love so much. I have a great deal of respect. One of my mentors is uh, Dr. Jack Hayford. And, uh, and he actually was the editor of this Bible. Great Bible. I encourage you to get that as well. Another good one is, this is excellent. It's called the Logos. This is the Bible program I use. It's phenomenal. And what they've done, they've taken a lot of the Bible programs, they put pictures in it, they put uh, illustrations, archaeological things, and they put it in this Bible. It's a very complete type of Bible. It won't tell you what to believe, but it will explain the culture. So, very helpful, everybody. Very helpful. And then you have some other ones. You have the Quest, and we're running out of time here. We also have the Cultural Background Study Bible, which is kind of fun if you're into archaeology and understand the cultures and all that. So these are some ideas of a Bible you can get out, okay? So you do it on your own, but you also need to do it in community. God has called us to work in community because I'll get things wrong and you'll get things wrong. We're not perfect. We need each other. God always said two or three. He didn't say all by yourself. He sent his disciples out by twos, right? So on my own and also in community. Now, put it in my heart. How do I get the word in my heart? How do I do that? Let the word of God, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. How do I do that? How do I let it dwell richly? Last week we spoke about this. We're going to have two more illustrations. I've hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. It's all about the heart. Remember we talked about that. And we talked about the fact that it's focused more on your heart than behavior. Behavior matters. But you get your heart right, your heart will change your behavior.
but you can have all the right behavior and have the wrong heart. That's key. So let the word get in your heart. Well, how do you do that? Okay? Our behavior and actions does infect our heart, and it has an effect upon our heart. So behavior still matters, everybody. But first is heart. Second is behavior. But watch out for behavior because it will harden your heart. Is that clear? Okay? Now, let me give you a little example of what happens. You get the word in you. How do you have the word of God richly dwell in you? Well, I have here some hot water. I hope it's still hot. Okay, I have some black tea here. And if you want to change the, the composition of the water, I know this is just water. So some of us go, you know, I'll go to church. Let me go ahead. I'm going to dip, myself, I'm going to dip myself in church. So you go to church on Sundays, and you just go like this, and you spend a few minutes, plug yourself out. It's a little change, right? Yeah, I'll go there. I'll listen to K-Love. I'm not going to mention a chicken sandwich. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, it's doing pretty good. I'll, I'll, I'll go once in a while. I'll go once a month. It's still, it's changed, right? But what happens if you every day spend time with the Lord, 15 minutes a day, five minutes in the Word, five minutes in prayer, five minutes praising Him through worship, and just let it sit there. Just let it soak every day in and out. I'm constantly letting God, and all of a sudden, I'm not focusing on changing the water. All I'm worrying about is getting my, the tea bag in my life. I'm getting God's word in my life. I'm not going to worry about the rest. And God's word will change you. And the next thing you know it is a cup. Your whole composition changes. And all you have to do is let his word come in your life. That's a lot of tea. Okay. Take care how you hear. For the one who has, more will be given. I have to warn you as well that when God gives you enlightenment, you and I need to pay attention to an enlightenment right away. Because if we do not pay attention to that, what he's told us, the enemy will come and take it away from us. And you won't even care anymore. Take care how you hear. For the one who has more, more will be given. But I don't know what God wants me to do with my life. I don't know what my future is. What should I do with retirement? Should I move to Florida? No. <laughs> should I stay in Connecticut, stay in Cornerstone? What, what should I do? Lord? No, I'm just kidding. That's my own. Don't listen to that. But what happens if I have all these ideas? Listen, what did God tell you to do right now? Spend time with me. Amen. Do that. Get involved. But what about? Don't worry about that. You just take care of today, and tomorrow will take care of itself, and God will give you more. If you listen to what you know, he'll tell you what you don't know. Okay? Take care then how you hear. For the one who has more, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he thinks that he has will be taken away. And if you hear God's word, don't listen to it. After a while, even the knowledge you have, God will hand you over to a reprobate mind. Hand you over to yourself. That's one of the scariest things in the world. I'm not afraid of anyone else. I'm afraid of me without God. So bow our heads and Close our eyes. Lord Jesus, we want to let your word richly dwell in our lives. God, we recognize we need your word. Holy Spirit, we need you. We need your light. We need your enlightenment. We need your presence, oh God. And Father, we're asking today, Lord, forgive us for putting you on the back burner. Everything else comes first. Lord, with the best way we know how, we want to start giving you that five to ten minutes a day. Even if it's small, God, we want to give you our lives every day. Get in your word every day, Lord. Get in your word. Father, let your word transform me. God, I need your word. I long for your word, God. Thank you for your word. So, Lord, I pray you give a hunger and a thirst for your word. Holy Spirit, move in our lives. May this be known as a church that loves you and loves your word and walks in your word and grows in your word and that we're transformed in Jesus' name.